Imagine with me for a moment that you knew exactly what was going to happen in the next few hours. And not only that, but that you knew you will be brutally executed. That you know not only when you will die, but also the time, the manner, and the means of your death. What is the last thing that passes through your head in that moment? What do you think about? What do you consider in your heart? I have read stories of people on death row, those who are awaiting death, both the innocent and the guilty. And your politics on the ethics of the death penalty may be different to mine, but their stories, almost all of them, are similar. It is the waiting that breaks them, the not knowing when the hour is coming. In Kenya, the last execution was held in 1980 or in the 80s, yet there are those who are still being convicted to hang. I have visited with them. I have heard their stories, how the guards sometimes cruelly joking tell them, tomorrow, tomorrow is a day of your death. It is the waiting that fills their hearts with despair. Today, we're going to be looking at a story of someone who is about to be executed, an innocent man. He's about to go through the worst kind of execution known to man. He knows he's about to be tortured, that he will be brutally punished, flogged, and beaten, that all this will be done in front of his family, his loved ones, and his friends. And as he gets ready for this horrible day, he spends time in prayer. And this prayer, this beautiful prayer, gives us a glimpse into where his heart is. If you haven't figured it out by now, we are talking about Jesus and his prayer in John 17. In verses 1 to 5, Jesus is praying for himself. In verses 6 to 19, Jesus is praying for the disciples. And in verses 20 to 26, Jesus prays for the people of God everywhere at all times. That's you and I. That's us, his church. What we will learn is that there is a lesson here about prayer and a lesson about the Lord's will for his people. It is absolutely amazing that on his last night, the last night of Jesus' earthly life, he chooses to spend it serving as a great high priest, making intercession with the Father on our behalf. And he prayed for God's glory, like we've said in verse 1 to 5. And he prays for God's gifts. That's you and I and his disciples, verse 6 to 19. And then he prayed for God's grace over us, verse 20 to 25. You will be amazed to find that in this prayer, we find that he also prayed for us, you and I. Let us pray and get right into it. Father, we thank you so, so much for this opportunity we have to read this prayer to think through what the Lord himself was praying for, considering the night before he was executed. Lord, thank you that he thought about us. And as he went to that cross, he not only took our shame, our guilt, and our sins, but he also clothed us in righteousness on his resurrection. Be glorified today. In Jesus' name, amen. First, we're going to look at how Jesus prays for God's glory, verse 1 to 5. And this is what the Word of God says. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You see, taking you back to this moment, there's a lot on Jesus' mind, particularly the cross. Not only the cross, but how he will end up on that cross. Uh, also, at this particular time, there is a betrayal happening, most probably happening as he's just praying this prayer. He knows he's about to face the soldiers, to be imprisoned, to be tried, to be mocked, insulted, and humiliated. Then the crucifixion will follow. This prayer really marks the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And he prays. The first few words before he prays, John notes, and he says that when Jesus had spoken these words, 
These words John was referring to were the upper room conversation recorded from chapter 13 to chapter 16. And it would be amazing if you could spend this week reading that passage uh, of scripture from chapter 13 to chapter 16. And everything he had been saying in the upper room discourse, all those table talks with the disciples, that was done now. He had finished the conversation with the promise of ultimate victory at the end of chapter 16. And after having spoken these things, he turned away from his disciples and he lifted his eyes to heaven and here he's going to pray to the father to bring to pass all the redemptive purposes to which he was called to bring to pass the plan which was from eternity to bring to reality all the pledges and promises that Jesus had made then he says father the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Uh, to everyone, from the religious leaders to the Romans, the citizens of Jerusalem, the visitors in Jerusalem, everyone present in that day, the cross appeared to be an instrument of shame. But to Christ, it was the moment to bring glory to God. And so Jesus, looking at the cross, says, the hour has come, glorify your son. The world saw it as the shaming of Jesus Christ. And I promise you, hell celebrated when he was crucified. They celebrated thinking that they had won a great victory that day. The world saw it as a shameful act. Hell saw it as a victory for their camp. Jesus, though, it was glory for him, glory for Jesus Christ. Jesus is simply praying, may my death glorify you, my God. May my sacrifice be sufficient, and in that, may you be glorified. May my resurrection glorify you. In verse 4, he says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. This, this was his mission all along. He came to live a sinless life and die a sinner's death. And he follows it up with verse 5, a reminder that he had laid aside all the glory he had in order to come to become a father, the father's servant. Uh, Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, reminds us of this very fact. He says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by making, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Not only to be born in the likeness of men, but to redeem men, to save our souls, to restore our relationship with the Father, to take away the shame and the guilt that covered us from the fall. Yes, to some, the cross brought upon shame. But when we look at the cross from this other side, knowing what we know now, knowing what we know today, when we look at the cross, we see God on display like no other place else in all of scripture. We see his love. We see the cross as a place where he sent his son to die in our place, cemented in the great verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. It is at the cross that we are reminded that we are saved by grace. It is at the cross that we see God's mercy for I am not enough to pay for my own sin. So Jesus takes my place on that cross. You see, his power over sin and death and hell and over Satan was all displayed on that cross. Others may be seeing shame. Jesus prays and says, this is why you sent me. May you be glorified. Then in verse 6 to 19, he prays for God's gift. Jesus prays for the disciples the Father has given him. And he says this, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world, you as they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. And I ha and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I, I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. 
and I am no longer in the world. But they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them to you, I have given them your word, and, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I think, I, I think it is beautiful that as Jesus is saying, the hour is here, that he knows he's about, what is about to happen. He takes time to pray for his disciples. He thinks back to the three or so years of ministry and teaching with his chosen disciples and summarizes it with this phrase. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world, you as they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. It, it, it indicates that Jesus did not simply teach about the name and character of God. He manifested and displayed that character of God to them. Jesus lived out the love and goodness and righteousness and grace and holiness of God the Father. He manifested God's name to them. But the same way, he knows what he is about to face. He knows that they are about to face trials and persecution. He loves them. He knows them. And he knows that when they have needed him, he has been there. And he takes time to pray for them here and now. And he says this in verse 9, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, for, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. He is not saying that he doesn't care for the world. No, his prayer is pointed for those he has been walking with. And he prays a few things specifically. He, he refers to the disciples and by extension to you and I, he, he refers to them as a gift given from God to him. And he prays, verse 10 and 11, that all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. He prays that God would preserve them, that they would be kept by the Father. Believe me, brothers and sisters, if anyone knew how broken the world was and is, it is Jesus. Jesus knew firsthand the wickedness of the world, and he was about to face the full force of that wickedness on the cross. And he had seen the wretchedness of the human heart. He knew that left to themselves, the disciples would not be able to maintain their relationship with the Father. Therefore, he prays for them that God the Father would keep them. Uh, doesn't it comfort you? Or rather, does it comfort you to know that this is the prayer Jesus prays for you even now, that God would keep you? See, he follows that prayer for preservation with a prayer for protection in verse 12 and 5, 12, 12 to 15, and he says, Jesus prays that his disciples will be protected from the evil one. Jesus is merely praying that they be given strength to face the task at hand, the task of disciple making, that they may be given strength to face this, to, to stand against the attacks that they were sure to come from the devil. Then he says this in verse 12, I have guarded them. No, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Some people have a problem with this verse. And they ask, what hope did Judas have? After all, the scriptures call him the son of destruction who was set aside for the scriptures to be fulfilled. See, the words Jesus uses here point to Judas's character rather than Judas's destiny. Judas was characterized by his lostness. 
He was set in his ways, not that he was predestined to be lost from beginning. Verses 16 and 17, verses 16 to 19, Jesus closes this portion of the prayer out by praying for his disciples and he prays for their purity. Jesus prays to the Father to set them apart from the world by the word of God. His prayer is that they might live their lives against the backdrop of the scriptures and that they may live lives pleasing to the Father. Uh, that the beauty of this prayer as I see it, is that it reminds us that this was not only the heart of Jesus that night before his execution, but it remains the heart of Jesus to this very day. Jesus desires that we would live clean, holy, sanctified, and pure lives. He desires that we would find our definition of purity and sanctification not where the world defines it, but where the word of God defines it for us. And lastly, as he concludes the prayer, Jesus prays for grace. And he prays this in verse 20 to 26. He says, I did not ask for this only. Sorry, I do not ask for this only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, the disciples' word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also Sorry, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made them, I made, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. And this for me, rather selfishly, is my most favorite part of this whole prayer. The hour is drawing near. It is the eve of his crucifixion. He who knew no sin was about to have all the sin of the world from creation to the very end of time poured down his throat. He was about to go through the most gruesome, painful, and shameful death. And in this moment, Jesus turns his attention to those who will receive him down through the ages. Jesus took time to pray for you and me. And I don't know about you, but that causes my heart to rejoice. In verse 21 to 23, he prayed for the church, for our harmony in fellowship together, that we would be marked by this unity. His desire is that we will be able to get along in front of the world. See, remember a few weeks ago when, when Pastor Warwick was talking about the idea of 3D church, he reminds us that we are to do church not only to listen and receive, and sometimes we get so caught up in, in who, how we are with God that we forget, that we forget that we should be loving, caring, and honoring to those around us as well. How can we say that we love God, yet we hate our neighbors? The world watches us as followers of Jesus. They see how we treat each other, and it matters. For we cannot say that we love Jesus, yet we do not live in harmony. Jesus prays that we would be one just like he and the Father are one. You are a walking billboard of God's forgiveness. If you are a follower of Jesus, may you know this that on the eve of his death, Jesus prayed for you that you would love other followers of Jesus. And how are you doing at that? In verse 24, he follows with this, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the earth. I, I love these words. This is Jesus in this prayer saying that his death on that cross is not an empty death. He prays for you. He prays the intention of his heart that everyone who receives Jesus will be with Jesus in heaven and will behold Jesus' glory. 
And then he chooses to close this prayer out and he prays this for our hearts. He prays, O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. As Jesus brought this prayer to a close, he took a minute to pray that we would be filled with his love. That that is his desires, uh, that his people will be characterized by, by a life of love for one another. This kind of love is God's demand for his children. Jesus received love from God the Father, and this love relationship was the strength and sustenance of his particular life. Everything he did stemmed from this love he received from God. And as he concludes this prayer, he prays the same love that was his strength and sustenance would fill his disciples. And not only his disciples in scripture, he would pray that he would, it would fill everyone who believes in him from then on. He prays that this love would be in you and I. Remember, when we started this sermon, we started with the idea of being on death row. If you don't know Jesus, you may not know it, but you are actually on death row right now. You are awaiting your death. And the enemy, like, like those guards that I was talking about, will, will come to you and will tell you every single day, today is the day you die forever. This prayer we have read today reminds us that Jesus has already paid the price for you, faced the execution that was meant for you so that you wouldn't have to. Why would you keep staying convicted when Jesus has declared your freedom, paid for it in full, prayed that you are protected by God, you are preserved by God, and that you actually have the joy of being with him in glory? If you do not know you may have been on death row, but today you have a way out. Give your life to him today. That's his prayer for you. Let us pray. Father, I pray today for anyone who's listening to this message. Lord, I pray for those of us who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Lord, may we be filled with joy in our hearts knowing that Jesus has prayed not only for our protection, that you would also preserve us despite the chaos and the persecution of the world. Lord, I pray that you would fill our hearts with your word, that we would be brought to remembrance, to remember everything we study about you, but not only that, that we would love other followers of Jesus. Lord, I also want to pray for those who do not know Jesus, those who are awaiting death and eternal death, Lord, I pray that they may know today that Jesus not only has paid the ultimate price, but also he is interceding for them right now before you as our high priest. And may they know that forgiveness is ready for them, that your grace is sufficient, that you love them today just as you did on the eve of your death. For your glory and our joy, in Jesus' name, amen.